It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome back to another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders. Alan, we just came into what I would say is the best bump music for a podcast. The people have spoken. They've agreed with that. Uh, Although, I will say, friend of the show, you know, maybe hearing some rumblings about people feeling that way. Someone in the YouTube comments even called him number two to ours. Uh, Chris Carter, Locked On, has changed the intro and outro music of his podcast. And I, I don't want to say that it's due to us. Well, I'll, I'll say it's due to us. I'll, I'll, I'll say it's due to us. It's, <laughs> it's due to us. He saw what we had and was like, I need that for me. These guys have come in. They're the new kids on the block. They've thrown the gauntlet down. I need to respond. It's very good. I, I, I'm not going to say it's bad. I'm not going to say it's better. I'm not going to say it's bad. But uh, we are we are creating a revolution in Pittsburgh podcast bump music by how high we have raised the standard. Uh, yeah. Honestly, like I feel like we are the Kendrick Lamar right now of Pittsburgh po- sports podcasts. Uh, they not like us. Does that Alan. make Carter Drake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm just saying <laughs> and anybody else that wants to fall in line uh, with their music as well. If they want, if they think that they can make an upgrade upon what we got going on. Yeah. More uh, power to them. It's not going to happen. But well, that was a great comment we had uh, ahead of yesterday's show, and and we had some great comments yesterday. Uh, I I got this one from Pernicious Progressive eighty three thirty three who says, "Here's my gripe with the show. Alan needs to just let go and tell us how he really feels." Uh, obviously, being sarcastic. Seriously though, I sometimes fear he's going to literally throw an embolism right before our eyes. <laughs> you guys obviously live an extremely healthy lifestyle. Uh, I hope that's sarcasm too, because I obviously do not. Alan's level of passion looks like the physical manifestation of hypertension. It's when we get our boys in cardio. So look, today uh, was the media day for the U.S. Senior Women's Open, which is going to be held at Fox Chapel Golf Club earlier this year. And Zach Weiss and Matt Geica, who are our uh, our golf pros on the uh, PSN staff, were not available. So I went and uh, pitched in. Uh, when you do a golf media junket thing, you play the course. I'm not a particularly good golfer. It was about 105 out there today, I think, real field temperature. Let's just say I did not shoot the thermometer. All right, let's just <laughs> let's leave it at that. So I'm tired. I'm still hot. I'm pretty sure I'm sunburnt. You're getting chill, Alan, today. I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, just going to tilt down a little bit. I'm we're taking it down a lot. I'm not angry are about you, it. Are the you typically? It's, yeah, it's over there somewhere. Are you typically a golf guy though? Like, do you play golf quite a bit throughout the year or no? Uh, I used to before I had this job, uh, and now I play okay. like yeah. two or three times a year, uh, which is very frustrating because I am capable of being a far better golfer than I currently am, uh, and that sucks. But yeah, not getting awful. the reps. I was awful today, clearly. Uh, you're just you're not getting the reps in. That, that, I was playing alongside I'm Paul Schofield of the Trib, and I told him after the end of the round, I was like, "Glad we weren't playing for money because I'd be giving you my paycheck right now." Uh, <laughs> Ducky, Ducky, clean my clock. There we go. Uh, you mentioned that comment. Another one that we had, kind of, I, I would say, in that same vein, but not really. Uh, Steelix, the Steelers fan, said, "I'm going to be honest. The first, at first, Allen used to make me so mad." But throughout the last couple of years, I've come to respect his ability to break the bad news with no remorse. Honesty is the best policy, and no one, Alan knows how to say it while being realistic. Thanks for your inputs. Love the show, and always look forward to mornings with you both. Go Steelers. What I thought was interesting about this, too, other than just the comment itself, looking forward to morning. So this is somebody that watches it back, obviously, the next day in the morning, which we've asked for that input before. Like, when are you guys watching and listening to the show? We would love to know that. Obviously, this is somebody uh, that is, is listening or watching on their morning commute. So we appreciate that. But uh, it's funny because like having gotten to know you over the last couple of years from the outside looking in, like when I was just like a fan and like had the blinders on, I could almost agree with this sentiment because I would be like, this guy makes me so mad. He's just always Debbie Downer about the teams that I love. 
and then actually like building a friendship with you and getting to know you. I was like, no, he's just really telling it how it is. It's just like sometimes the fans don't want to see it that way because we're just so optimistic about the teams that we love. Yeah, it was like the PFF conversation the other day, and the guy's like accusing me of just sticking up for TJ Watt because that's what the fan base wants to hear. I'm like, buddy, that is not <laughs> what I specialize in at all. Like I, the exact opposite. I kind of go out of my way to say things that I think are true that people don't want to hear. And I think that's an important part of my job. Like if all I'm telling you is what you want to hear, then what, what utility am I? Like you can say it like, and, yeah. and anybody can say it, you know, you need someone that is unafraid to say what's going really going on, what's wrong and right. And I think though that like there is a there's like an acceptance period where like you might hate me or you might think I'm really annoying. And then like after enough like enough time has to go like damn, he was right about that too. God, I hate that, but he, he is like that's that's uh that's what I'm going for. So I I, I got at least one uh one person <laughs> uh, thank you i really i really truly uh genuinely appreciate comments like that because that is exactly what i'm going for right there like that's a hundred percent of what i'm trying to do is make you all mad at first and then get you to realize that i was right and not just a jerk i think like when we like started to i, I can't remember how long ago it was when we first started following each other but i feel like honestly our conversations that weren't about sports is why we actually ended up like forming a, a friendship uh obviously you know you're a you self-proclaimed pizza snob so you know maybe a lot of it built through that as well but yeah i don't know i mean i have to agree with the sentiment because i've even seen for myself like firsthand the evolution into turning the page on alan saunders and coming around on alan saunders i love that i love that for me i love that for us i love that for the podcast that was cool uh <laughs> should we talk about football or should we just talk about ourselves for the i actually episode? but i do want to bring up one more comment as i was going through okay. here that i appreciated just because it was on an episode that we did that was very different if you guys didn't watch or listen uh the july 4th show last go week back was very because different. that one doesn't matter that it's old it's still funny Right. Yeah, it's it's timeless. Um, so Brooklyn commented on here and said, maybe you guys have done this before and I just didn't see it. I almost didn't watch because most fourth podcasts are throwaway episodes, but this was so good. Alan knows the players personality wise, so it made it even better. You should do stuff like this again for other holidays if you don't already. It's a nice change of pace. So we mentioned when we did that episode, we did something similar um, Thanksgiving. But I did. I do think that we we tweaked it in a nice way, and I would love to, you know, incorporate things like this into that. Alan had the great idea with doing it like Fourth of July themed. Um, so yeah, we appreciate that. We appreciate that you guys recognize that it was a nice change of pace, something different for us, something different for you guys, and you know maybe that is something that we will continue to do when we have you know a holiday fall on a weekday where we know we want to put out an episode. And I like the draft thing too. I thought it was good when we did the mock drafts. I thought that was good, like going back and forth. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we'll do that. Uh, maybe we'll do that ahead of training camp. Here we'll pick our like our our training camp darlings or something like that, and we'll 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 get our guys. Um, I have a a good friend who is a very religious uh, viewer of the podcast. I was talking to him right before we went on today, and I said, "Hey man, what do you want to hear?" And uh, he said, "Let me know who is." in position to make this team that nobody is talking about. I think that was a interesting question as we kind of you know, like, it's too early to really like do serious training camp previews because we'd be done with it and have a week to go for training camp. But I think <laughs> yeah. this is something we can talk about. Like some people that I think maybe um, like if you're planning on going out to St. Vincent, uh, these are some guys to watch for. I think that's a good way to put it. Like, Put put the put some names on your on your radar. Do you have any of those for yourself personally? Because this is, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have your own opinions here. Yeah, I mean, I was just say how much of this conversation too was kind of opened up um, with the Cam Sutton stuff. Like those names are obviously guys that we've talked about. Whether it's you know Graylin Arnold, Beanie Bishop, who we've talked about a lot, Josiah Scott, like guys that are slot capable. I think that's gonna be a fun battle to watch amongst guys that aren't household names. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, a name that you brought up pretty early in the process this spring 
who's a corner. I'm curious to see like where he fits in. Nate Metters, I think, is going to be a guy to watch as well in training camp. I, I'm not saying for sure that he's going to go out there and, and earn a job or anything like that, but I think he'll be interesting to watch. Uh, and then the running backs behind the guys that we already know, like who's going to be that guy that can carve out a role or will try to do so. Uh, Dejon Edwards, will he be the guy? You've talked a lot about Aaron Shamplin. So to me, like those are probably the two spots where I'm looking at like corner and running back. I think there's going to be a guy that maybe isn't a name that we've talked about right now that ends up making the 53 there. Yeah. Nate Metters is a real interesting guy, man. Like he was, uh, he was in the XFL. He was with the bears. He was in the XFL last year. He caught on with the Browns for a little bit, landed with the Steelers. I think he's someone that like, man, I think he has more to give than he's shown. He's a little bit older, um, you know, has been bounced around a bunch. I think he's been on like seven teams or something like that. No oh, chance. Um, but I think like he he's just he looks the part. I think that's the thing that like you figure out for for when you've been doing it for a while. He really reminds me of Elijah Riley in a lot of ways. Like, mm. like I, I, he feels like a very similar player. And I think the ability to play some slot, play some free safety play some special teams that's a that's a i don't know that he's gonna make the roster roster but like i could absolutely see him making the practice squad without without much question i I think he's a a good player josiah scott is someone that like especially in the aftermath of this cam sutton news that i don't think like nearly enough people are talking about like josiah Mm -hmm. scott is good uh josiah scott was good for the eagles when he played those games that we talked about yesterday like he was a fourth round pick out of Michigan State. Like this guy's never been bad. Like it's not like he's some scrub just because uh you know the Steelers snagged him. Um and so I think uh I think he can play. Thomas Graham, I really liked him coming out of Oregon. Uh mm-hmm. you know, got drafted in the sixth round. He's small, he was really small, but uh I think you know he he has skills. I, I agree that the secondary has a lot of those um, pieces that have opportunities to make an impact, specifically because of the uncertainty with Sutton, but also just like it's a pretty unseasoned underbelly of the secondary, right? Like, I mean, yeah. you're looking at like safety five is Ryan Watts and corner outside corners, you know, three and four are Rush and Trice and. I don't even know who outside yep. corner five is. Kalen Barnes, I guess. Like, yeah, like that. I don't know. There's Anthony, there's room. Anthony Averett right now, probably. Anthony right? Averett, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's 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 not there's there's places to make an impact there, for sure. And yeah, so I, I, think, uh, I think of those two spots right away. I mean, I guess the other one for me that I'm I'm really intrigued by because they didn't bring in a a veteran body there uh, is Jeremiah Moon like because of that edge four spot, like we, we all expect that Nick Herbig is going to elevate into that edge three role and they want to get him on the field a lot more in year two as I understand what he was able to do in his rookie season. Absolutely. A sophomore jump should be in the cards, but you know, between him, Kyron Johnson, like somebody's going to make this team as edge four, who, who's it going to be? So I, I would be watching, you know, those two guys as well. Um, would you throw, I mean, I, I, I don't know that he, fits the same mold body type wise like david perales maybe in that conversation i would 100 well, like throw david perales okay. in this conversation david perales fascinates me i just like him i think as a guy first of all like i'll be honest mm-hmm. about that like I, I but like he had a million sacks at fresno state which is not like there's a million and one actually it, it's not awful football like it's not like he came from some fcs mm-hmm. school okay uh and he had a 11 and a half sacks his senior year at Fresno State in 14 games. That's that's big numbers. Um yeah. like th- that that's like and he had seven the year before. So it's not like it was like some like out of the blue thing. And then his um his testing numbers were atrocious. Like his RAS was like three or something like that. And out of 10, that's not good. And so you know, that's why he ends up going undrafted. And you know he didn't really get much of a chance with the Steelers last year. He was around, but they are they had they had Golden, they had Herbig ahead of him. They kept Paralysis on the practice squad for a while. Obviously, they saw something they liked. I just think he's a fascinating example of like, yeah, when you weight traits in draft picks, <clears throat> like the the median 
cases are easy, right? Like, but mm -hmm. the extreme cases are hard. Like, how valuable is a great athlete with no production? And how valuable is a guy with incredible production that's an awful athlete? Like, I think those are difficult questions to answer. And I think that's why I'm really fascinated by David Perales. I think he has a chance to win a role. Um, and, and honestly, I think like, like they're probably going to keep five inside linebackers because I think that's a deeper position, yeah. but across the board, like linebacker roles are, are going to get more work in special teams than they have in the past because of the new kickoff rule. I think you're going to see fewer, you know, like their kickoff special the kickoff coverage guys have been miles Boykin and James Pierre. Like, I think you're going to see bigger guys, um, in those roles going forward because they don't have to run 10 yards now. And so I think he's got a legitimate shot to make the team. And I'm just sort of very fascinated by Kyron Johnson's a very interesting guy too. Like he is just like, remember when Nick Herbert got drafted and there were people, I think I was actually one of those people that said like, he kind of looks like he probably should be an off ball linebacker. Just if you like look at the mm -hmm. body and the athlete. Kyron Johnson's like 85% of the size of Nick Herbig. <laughs> like he's so small. I don't even know like what, like how it works. Um, he's an interesting guy too. I I will be, uh, you know, it's, that's going to be a wild competition because I, you know, will they bring somebody else in? They might. Um, but I, I think the guys they have there are interesting too. Uh, I'm trying to think of some more guys down the roster that maybe don't have like obvious paths to getting a roster spot, but just that I, think are more talented than maybe <laughs> their their Q score among the fan base would suggest. Um I really like Joey Fisher, the guard out of mm -hmm. Shepherd, D2 guy. Um he's from Baltimore. We won't hold it against him. Uh just a big strong athlete runs well not a great pass blocker, but man, like gets in space and he hits people hard and kind of reminds me of like a throwback kind of player. Like, like he would have fit in like inside of Craig Wolfley on a Steelers offensive line in 1983, like just fine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if he has like the pass protection shops to like make it in the NFL, but like he's a guy that really interests me. Um, he's the only offensive lineman that has a listed weight under 300. I'm sure some of them are actually under 300, but like when you go out there and be like, yeah, 290. And then you see the dude and it's like, you're like, all right, what's going on here? He can run. I think that's interesting. Um, yeah. I mean, they're not, I think we've talked about a lot of them. <clears throat> yes, yeah, I, I think most of them are in the secondary. To be honest, I mentioned the running backs though. Like, is there is there one there that we're not really thinking about? Jonathan Ward uh, is a guy like has experience. Um, is a really good pass protector. He just feels to me like the kind of guy you, that hangs around. Um, he has the traits that like rookie running backs don't have. Um, he's big. He's physical. He knows how to block. Um, he like he's a guy in backs on backers that I expect to do well, um, which I do not say about rookie running backs usually. That's why Jalen Warren was a phenom, right? Because he got in there and he dominated that drill as a rookie. And not only as a rookie, as a 5'8 rookie, right? Um, mm -hmm. He was awesome. And so... Uh, and that, I mean, that, that's interesting you're saying that about rookie backs, though, because that's the one thing, like, somebody on the team that I had a conversation with was like, that is where you're going to see Edwards, like, where he's going to shine if you will that's not the word they use but like if he's going to earn a job it's because of the work that he does in backs on backers and in pass protection because he's very advanced uh compared to where you would normally see a rookie back be yeah i thought he kind of fell into the trap of like fine during otas where like naturally we just kind of gravitate to the unusual so people do stuff that kind of makes your jaw drop or, or opens your eyes in a way that you didn't expect those are the things that like you look that like I want to highlight. I want to write about those are the people I want to talk to. I didn't think Dejan Edwards did anything wrong. It was just sort of okay across the board. You know what I mean? Where like, yeah, it, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't head turning either. He could do that in, in backs on backers. Um, dude, Aaron Shanklin. I know I talked about him a lot here already, but um, I just think his receiving ability is really 
high level. And I mean, they gave him a ton of opportunities in OTAs. So that the, so it they sounds try. like what's in that room though, like very different. Like, what are they going to be looking for in that other back? Or are they going to like have any like with Cordero? Patterson? Maybe two of them. Maybe maybe two of them will make the practice squad. You know, maybe there's two spots there. I don't know. Maybe there's a little guy and a big guy. You got Jack Coletto in that mix too. The full the 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 lonesome mm-hmm. fullback. Hopefully, yep. the, their fullback makes it into the hitting part of training camp without retiring. <laughs> that would be a win for the team. If we Say, get. We're- we're in the same page. I was just about to say that. Literally, if we could like, get it, the fullback to wearing pads at training camp, that would be a step forward from last year. Yeah, I, and I know my guy uh, Jake Wade will will appreciate the the shout out for Coletto there. Not somebody that I expect to push for a roster spot at all. I think he's penciled in uh, for the practice squad. But I want to see what they do with John Rice Plumley at training camp, just because like he's so interesting in terms of the skill set that he has. I just want to watch him and see what they do with him. First of all, John Rice Plumley is listed at six foot two oh three. No, nope. and and like, <laughs> no, nope. there's just no freaking way. I'm sorry. Yeah, like, yeah. there's just no way. Like, there's just no, there's just no. I'm sorry. Yeah. there's there's no way. Like, some people are like, oh, is he Taysom Hill? And I'm like, he might be half of Taysom Hill. <laughs> like, he is he's Tays. Not he's Taysom Hill of Taysom Hill. <laughs> His he was listed he, at the combine. He was measured. Okay, you know, five eleven and 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 three quarters. So I guess that's six foot two oh three. That's the combine weight. I, I, I he had a bowling ball hidden behind his shirt. I think <laughs> while he was being weighed. Uh, yeah, that's the. Only I mean, I haven't seen him up close. I'm not even talking about like videos that I've seen from him in a Steelers uniform either. Just like you, like you can tell to me, look at watching him play like UCF and stuff. Like he's not that big. Like I don't know. I don't know how you're like whose kid is that? Oh, never mind. That's John Rice. <laughs> <laughs> he's just Seriously. a thin, thinly built dude. And look, George Pickens is a thinly built dude too. He just happens to be six yeah. four. Like you don't have to be you know, strapped with muscles to be a good NFL player. I'm fascinated by the athleticism. I'm just, I, I, I agree with you that I, I can't wait to see what they cook up with him. I think, I think like we could see him return kicks. Like that's realistic. I to was me. just going to ask that or like, obviously Cordero about- Patterson is going to be the main kickoff returner, but I mm-hmm. do think you're going to see an amount of like, two safety returns where you have two kind of deep return men. And I'm not sure who that there's like an obvious answer for who the other one is. Maybe it's Jalen Warren. Maybe it's one of these other running backs, uh, you know, Quez Watkins or Scotty Miller or Calvin Austin, but like put Plumlee out there. Like there are going to be teams that run like set plays off these kickoffs where it's like you catch the ball and now it's like a counter. Or now it's like a crack toss, like like that, like yeah. it's an option, like that's what's going to happen on these kickoffs. I think there's there's a real reason to want a quarterback out there on the field. I, I also Mark don't knows. like the Steelers are saying that they're not going to have Justin Fields return a kickoff. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, I actually just got this prop bet. I don't know where it is if it's onshore and legal to bet or not, but I would bet one dollar on Justin Fields uh, over. 0.5 kickoff returns this year easily I, I i would i would make that wager i want to see it so i would be down for that but i was going to ask about Plumley just because when he signed with the steelers like one of the first questions of course was asked you know why the steelers and he said because they're letting me you know be a quarterback so i was curious to see how far will we range into his versatility as a player that's why, like, I, while I understand he's not going to make the 53 man roster, like I said, I think he's penciled in for the practice squad. I want to see what they do with him at training camp. How far are we going to stretch this um, versatility that he offers? And I would love to see him on some kickoffs. I so, would too. I'm here for it. Uh, going down the rest of the roster. Yeah. I don't know if there's anybody else that I'm thinking about too much. I think I've mentioned all the guys, but like there's going to be somebody in the receiver room that we're not talking a whole lot about. Right. I mean, even if it's like a name that we have touched on just because they're currently on the roster, like far better opportunity in the Steelers room than pretty much any other room across the league, just because of, you know, it, it's George Pickens. And then, and then what, like pretty much every other spots open. I think Des Fitzpatrick probably doesn't get, like, 
he has the like mm. the curse of having been here, so he's not new or shiny. But yeah. I think he's better than all the rest of the guys that were not in the NFL last year. You know, like you know, he, he can play. Um, I, I would not be surprised to see him stick around again, to, to see him be like an injury call up. I, I think that's I think that could absolutely happen. He's another guy that's a doing a lot of hard work to be a, a good special teamer. I think he could absolutely stick around. You know what I didn't realize about um, Steelers wide receiver Jacob Copeland is that that video, that like viral video where the woman gets up and walks away when he puts on the hat is Jacob Copeland. Really? Yes. Okay. You know the video I'm talking about where like, the yeah. I don't know if it's his mom or his grandmother gets up from the table when he puts yeah, the yeah, hat on. Yeah. Yeah. The, the recruits yeah, are recruiting, you know, the recruiting, uh, you know, college recruiting, you got the, ha- that the hats, you know, you're going to, mm-hmm. you put on the Miami hat or the Florida hat. I think he went to Florida, right? He Is went to Florida, Florida and then ended up transferring to Maryland. Yeah. 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 So you got the Miami hat and the Florida hat and the Alabama hat and you do the old little like, Oh ooh, I, no. Ooh, oh no. It's this one. And his mom's just like, <laughs> grabs her purse and leaves like yeah that that's uh i did not know that was him that's crazy mm-hmm. he was a four-star recruit that chose florida and then she obviously wanted him to go to bama based off her uh body language reaction there um but yeah not ended florida. up not finishing in florida anyway well nobody finishes where they start now anyway so that's that's the hammer there good that's stuff true. um if you are a draft nick which i know a good part of this audience is uh, there's a really good thread on Twitter by a friend of the pot. We should try to have him on actually. Eric Gauco is the director of the East West Shrine Bowl. And mm. he put up on Twitter a long thread about the 2025 NFL draft. And, you know, he, one of the things he said was half of the quarterbacks in this year's draft pool were transfers. They're like, that is just, the way it's going to be that like NFL teams don't really like that, but they're not going to have a choice anymore that they're going to have to deal with kids that transfer, transfer twice. Um, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and so I think that's, that that's an interesting sort of thing to keep in the back of your mind as we uh, move into a new landscape in college football and how it's going to mm-hmm. impact the Steelers and the NFL draft. And, um, let's see if I can get Eric uh, lined up here for us because he'd be a really good guest. Yeah, that would be awesome. I'm glad when you started talking about people being uh, draft folks on here, I immediately and it's it's bad, but you'll understand why. I immediately just thought you were gonna like talk about something Derek put out on the site or something, just because that's well, Derek has also been writing about <laughs> like 2025 draft stuff. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. He has one story there for the SM Plus subscribers. Use promo code Allen Ten, get ten dollars off, get all the best stuff from Derek Bell, myself, and the rest of the staff at SiriusNow.com. And uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, he, he has a story just out like uh, earlier this week, actually, uh, about that. And I'll be wrapping up my regrading Kevin Colbert's draft assignment here this week too, so that'll be up there. But yeah, I, I think the 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 conversation about the the way the draft is changing is interesting. Um, the this will be the end of the COVID year, guys. So like nobody yeah. this year will be a six year player. Well, almost nobody. You have to have two injuries to be a six year player now. Um, so it should be a deeper draft class. That that do not be surprised if like everybody drafted on day three in the NFL this year gets cut. Like I, I would not be surprised if any of them get cut it's a it was a very weak draft class this year is expected to be better in 2025 but like when you're when you're sitting there uh you know looking at your roster trying to make your 53 man projection like just because they're drafted don't don't put them in ink because this is a pretty weak third day of the draft overall this year yes absolutely uh interesting stuff without going too much into it because obviously we want the people to read it what did you learn, if anything, differently about the way that you had previously thought about Kevin Colbert's last few drafts? I think that it's hard to critique strategy for a general manager. Like, when you look at Najee Harris, the pick from 2021, mm-hmm. like I think it's a bad pick. And I said it at the time. I've never at any point in between now and then have said anything other than I will probably – 
Never changed my mind about that. It was a bad pick. But you look at what was on the board, and it's hard to say, oh, we should pick this guy instead. You know, it, it's because, like, so much of general managing is strategy and opportunity cost. And, like, oh, they wanted to set up their team to fix the running game, so they let James Conner go. He only signed for, like, a million and a half. And they used their first-round pick on a running back. Like, that – whole process was dumb and bad but when you specifically compare Najee Harris to the players that were drafted in the immediate aftermath of him on the board it looks like a pretty defensible pick like there aren't like a lot of players that were better and so I think that's the thing that I've kind of learned is that um it, Kevin Colbert could still scout very few scouting misses in there Kendrick Green stands out as kind of the one guy so far I've looked at mm -hmm. it was more about strategy than scouting like Dan Moore Dan Moore is a real, like, if you are talking about what you're getting out of a fourth round pick, if you get a guy who is a three year, maybe more starter at left tackle, that is like the best you can do with a fourth round pick. However, if you are setting your football team up to need to start your rookie fourth round pick at left tackle, that's awful and bad. You should never do that. Like, but so yeah. I think the way I'm looking at it, though, is comparing to the players that are on the board and sort of the draft consensus at the time. A lot of the picks hold up better than I thought they would in, in that in that way. Good stuff. All right. Well, I mean, I look forward to you finish it up, be able to go back through it. But uh, yeah, so be able to uh, check that out, everybody over there. Alan, tell the people where they can find you. I'm going to go take a nap so you can find me on my couch. For the <laughs> next 30 I don't know if you hours. want anybody finding you while you're doing that, but. I mean, if they get there in time, like, it's fine. It's whatever. <laughs> yeah. Just, I mean, if you want to come cuddle or, you know, like there's room, like I'm not saying I'm not going to stop napping, but like, whatever. Um, a Saunders underscore PGH on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, PGH Steelers Now, the site's account, and all those places. SteelersNow.com. That's where the words live. Freedom so I can get paid. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Go tell Chris Carter on Locked On Steelers. I was on Locked On Steelers today. Go uh, go tell Chris Carter that our bump music is still better. And uh, it was a nice try. <laughs> nice try. That's cute. Uh... <laughs> Uh, 12,858 YouTube subscribers as it stands right now. So be sure to keep those numbers coming. We'll hit 13 K here in the very near future, but like subscribe, hit the notification bell to help us get there. Hit us in the comments, any questions, thoughts about what we talked about on this episode, obviously all that good stuff. If you're listening somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever your podcast from, leave us a five-star review, subscribe over there. Steelers afternoon drive. Uh, you'll find us whatever listening platform you choose. Uh, also, TikTok, as Alan mentioned, Steelers Afternoon Drive. Be sure to hit us up over there if you are on TikTok. You can find me everywhere, Zachary Smith PGH. For Alan Saunders and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive.